We're going to read today from the Gospel of Mark in chapter 6, second half of verse 6 through verse 12. So we call that 6b through 12 in Mark chapter 6. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the twelve to him. He sent them out two by two and gave them authority over evil spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra tunic. Wherever, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you, have, until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. And I, I do pray, Lord, that um, what you have prepared in my heart is worthy of sharing with your congregation. Because really, Lord, I hope and pray that it is from you and not from me. So we just pray for your word to do what you said your word would do. To not return unto you void, but to accomplish that for which you sent it. Ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, Jesus trained his disciples for three years. He didn't just lecture them and teach them the Bible. He also sent them out, as we read about today, to do practicums, legwork, get some actual experience of interacting with people. That's got to happen in our ministry, too. A pastor I admire once said that if all the people do in churches listen to a sermon lecture every Sunday, that's like a mechanic trying to learn about cars without ever getting to lift the hood and turn wrenches on an actual engine. One of the reasons this is really important is because recent studies of the millennial generation consistently show that the main reason they don't attend church is because they feel like it's boring and they feel that organized religion doesn't do anything but organize itself and take care of itself. They get the idea that faith takes it. They get the idea that faith takes action. Faith that shows love and blesses the community is more authentic and they want their lives to make a difference. Here's a short list of what they really care about. Doing small acts of kindness every day. Advocating for what they believe in. Getting involved in social issues such as poverty and education. If they are part of an organization, that's only because they trust that organization to support what they support. They want to use the collective voice to bring positive change. The greater good matters more than political affiliation. Being generous at a personal level is better than just making a donation to a big charity. And they want to engage with their peers in meaningful ways that bring change through big and small actions that serve a greater purpose. Well, when I read that, I thought, even though I'm old, I must be a millennial because that's what I believe the church is all about and ought to be about. I think maybe the only disconnect between the church and today's youth may be that today's youth don't realize how much power there is in the gospel to not just save lives and offer forgiveness, but to change us into a unified body of brothers and sisters who are determined to bless the world in which we live by representing God's kingdom and bringing God's kingdom on earth through our obedience to living by loving one another and seeking the lost. And I don't think it's their fault that they don't see the church that way. Much of the American church has forgotten or failed to live that way for a long time. That's got to change. And I'm grateful to be in a congregation that realizes that. Our food pantry ministry is one place where servants of God can volunteer, be involved in real ministry, and get some experience in caring about other people. I appreciate all of you that are involved with that. I also appreciate that a lot of our volunteers attend church elsewhere or nowhere. That's just proof of the value of what we're doing and that people want to be involved in doing good. Have you been blessed by your involvement? In our passage today, instead of door-to-door -door evangelism, Jesus sent his disciples out for town-to-town -to -town evangelism. 
His instructions have to do with mission management, mood, and message. First, he gave them instructions for mission management. There were to be six teams of two each, so each team could take different roads and cover a lot of territory. But six teams can only take six paths, while 12 individuals could seemingly cover twice as much territory. So why did Jesus send them out two by two if he wanted to be efficient? Well, there is significance to why they went in pairs. They went two by two for two reasons. Part of the answer lies in the Jewish tradition of two witnesses. The Old Testament law stipulated that at least two witnesses were needed in order to convict someone of a crime, and the culture of Jesus' day picked up on that and kept going with that legal requirement. It also underscored the common sense idea that two witnesses are more credible than one. So when two of Jesus' disciples proclaimed the presence of the kingdom, it increased their credibility that the message is true. They would be more likely to receive a hearing because there were two of them. Of course, it didn't hurt their credibility that they could also cast out demons and heal the sick. Then there's another reason why Jesus sent out his disciples in pairs. He may have been thinking of the power of shared ministry, the added impact when two or more people work together toward a shared goal. They would support and encourage each other. Just think of how hard it would be for a solitary preacher to keep going strong if he faced much rejection or opposition. This co-laboring is not only effective, but also reflects the theology of ministry in the era of the New Covenant. By sending his disciples out two by two, Jesus foreshadowed the power in our unity of purpose and effort that would become the hallmark of the Spirit-filled church. So they went out two by two. Also in our text, we see that Jesus gave them specific instructions about the provisions they would need to have with them. It was minimal. Take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no money in your bag, belts, wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. They traveled light. This was all they needed for provision. Sandals, staff, or a walking stick, and the clothes on their back. They were specifically instructed to take, to not take no bread, no bag, or money. How could you do that? Well, this was possible in that day because the culture around them practiced radical hospitality. Wherever they went, there would always be somebody who would invite them home and be willing to feed them and give them a place to sleep. There were no hotels or Airbnbs. They were to rely on local hospitality. It was a cultural expectation, just plain good manners, that everyone should be willing to entertain strangers if they could. And in just about every town, there was at least somebody who had enough resources and space to function as a local inn at no charge to the guests. The host's reward was that God would be pleased. You can still find that kind of hospitality in many places in the Middle East. Wouldn't it be something if we could practice that kind of hospitality here? And some wish we would. There's a book out there called The Gospel Comes with a House Key. Imagine sharing the gospel by welcoming people into your house. Nevertheless, what this traveling light would really mean to the disciples is that it would require them to walk by faith that God would provide for them the way he feeds the sparrows and clothes the flowers. They could rely on God. Jesus' next instruction said, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. There would be no shopping around to find another home with better food or accommodations, they were to be content with what God provided. We can travel light too. This is where it comes home to us. We can learn to be content with what God provides. The principle is the thing. Trust the Lord to provide and do not worry about what you will eat or what you will wear. Okay, so besides mission management, 
Jesus' instructions also set a mission mood. This is indicated by the specific instruction about how to handle rejection. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. If nobody would listen to them, then nobody would offer hospitality either. They were not welcomed. It's easy to understand. If I do not like what you're saying, I will not be inclined to invite you to my house, despite the cultural expectation. So the scenario would go like this. The two disciples would enter a town and look for a public venue in which to share Jesus' message of repentance, probably the local synagogue, if not the marketplace. After the townspeople listened for a while, the disciples could read the crowd and they would know whether or not they were welcome in that town. By the time they were done talking, if nobody invited them home for dinner, they would definitely know they were not welcome. So in that case, they were to follow Jesus' instructions and just move on. And as they left, there was this symbolic gesture of shaking the dust off their feet. The townspeople might understand this to mean that they were being rebuked for their failure to welcome their guests. Shaking the dust off one's feet conveys the same idea as our modern phrase, I wash my hands of the whole affair. But for the disciples, it would mean that they would allow no trace of the town's unwelcoming attitude to stick with them. They were to let it go. This is forgiveness. You know, the sons of thunder wanted to call down fire upon a town for rejecting Jesus' presence once, remember? James and John were angry about a certain Samaritan village that did not welcome Jesus and the disciples because they were on their way to Jerusalem. This is recorded in Luke 9. They asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. No, guys, not fire. Patience is the rule. So shake the dust off your feet really means just forget about it. Shaking the dust off the feet is a symbolic indication that one has done all that one can in a situation and therefore carries no further responsibility for it. Where the disciples' message was rejected, they had no further responsibility. They were free to walk away with a clear conscience, knowing they had done all they could do. Shaking the dust off their feet was, in effect, saying that those who rejected God's truth would not be allowed to hinder the furtherance of the gospel. We also will face rejection sometimes as we seek to be fishers of people while we're trying to make and teach new disciples. Don't take rejection personally and don't let it put you off the mission. Keep up a good mood the best you can. Take the positive outlook. Just let it go and move on. Keep on being gracious and loving, not angry about rejection, but just move on too. So they were sent out two by two with specific instructions about mission management, how they should go, and also mission mood, how they should conduct themselves. But the most important thing, their focus, was to be the mission message. They went out and preached that people should repent. Now, I got something to say about that word. We usually understand repent in terms of turning away from sin. I'm going to turn that phrase a bit in a Jesus-style way. You have heard it said that repent means turn away from sin, but I say unto you that there is more to it than that. Repent really means rethink what life is all about. The root word pent has to do with thinking, not just how you think about sin and behavior, not just right and wrong, but really rethink, repent, gets at how you think about the meaning and purpose of life. Who's in charge and what's my responsibility? I believe this is what Jesus was talking about when he preached repent. It was not just about acknowledging sin and wrongdoing. It was about rethinking the meaning and nature of God's kingdom. Some evidence for this is in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus said so many times, you have heard that it was said, and then goes on to quote their usual way of thinking, such as do not commit adultery, which in their minds meant don't mess around with someone else's spouse. Then he would go on to say, but I tell you, 
and then show that they were not thinking about it deeply enough or the way God sees it, as in the case of adultery, where he said, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart, that's rethinking the definition of sin. So, when the disciples went out and preached repentance, they were not just calling people to step away from sin, they were trying to do what Jesus did in the Sermon on the Mount, that they had heard before they were sent out to repeat it. They were helping people rethink their definitions of sin and see how much more deeply guilty they were than they ever thought possible. This would apply particularly to the Pharisees who defined sin very carefully and controlled their outward behavior within those definitions so they could proclaim themselves as faultless. Jesus clashed with the Pharisees repeatedly over their failure to understand the deceitfulness of the human heart. He called them whitewashed sepulchers that looked clean on the outside but were filled with filth. In their cases, the filth in their hearts was this self-righteous pride and disdain for the sinners who didn't look as good. Now in our day, there is even more to rethink People today think that Christianity is just another religion in which people in charge are trying to run the lives of the believers with all the do's and don'ts and rules and regulations. But we know Christianity is not a religion. It's really about a relationship. We get to help people rethink that as we explain who Jesus really is. Jesus is the ultimate prophet who tells us the truth about ourselves and the world. He is the eternal high priest who stands between us and God to make things right between us. And Jesus is the almighty king, the one to whom we really owe all our allegiance. Look at that, three offices. I could make a whole nother three-point sermon out of that proclamation, right? But I, not today. Today I'm just going to point out that Christianity is not a religion of do's and don'ts. It's a proclamation of who God really is and his offer of forgiveness. The proclamation announces how much he loves us and how we can rightly relate to him through faith in Jesus' true identity as our Savior, Lord, and Master who gives our lives meaning and purpose. Jesus gives us a reason to live and power to live it out so that we do change the world through our works, moved by God's love. Jesus, now ascended, continues to fulfill his threefold office of prophet, priest, and king. In his heavenly exaltation, Jesus Christ exercises all three of those offices still. As prophet, he continues to declare both his law and his gospel, judging and absolving sinners through the frail ministry of human beings, people like us, getting to share the gospel. We have been given rest in a greater land through the gospel, led by the, a greater prophet than Moses or Joshua, and with a greater priest than Aaron or his descendants. Through his heavenly reign, with the spirit leading the ground war, Jesus Christ loots Satan's kingdom and sets the prisoners free. From his incarnation to his reign at the Father's right hand, Jesus is not only the Lord who became the servant, but the servant who is Lord and continues, even in this exalted state, to serve his Father's will and his people's good. That's us. From eternity to eternity, he offers his here I am to the Father on behalf of those who have gone their own way. For now Christ reigns in grace. When he returns in judgment and vindication, his kingdom will be consummated in everlasting glory. Now, wow, I don't know about you, but I'm excited. I can't believe that I actually get to be part of this, serving under the lordship of Jesus Christ, the ultimate prophet, the highest of the high priests, the almighty king of kings, and Lord of Lords. And have you noticed that these offices of Jesus Christ as prophet, priest, and king have ties to the Great Commission? The message of the Old Testament prophets was messianic message, 
a message that proclaimed good news and forgiveness. The good news is that God is angry with Satan, not with us. And because Jesus is our high priest, we can be forgiven, saved and set free from the clutches of judgment and death because Jesus died on the cross to secure our salvation and rose from the dead to declare his victory. As we enjoy the benefits of his forgiveness and grace, we realize that we love our king and pledge allegiance to serve him forever out of a grateful heart. And so I say, Christianity is a great organization to belong to. There is no greater organization to be part of. There is no work more meaningful and significant than helping people overcome poverty, racism, oppression, and any kind of tyranny that the work, than the work of telling them who we really are, how valuable they are, how dignified is their work, that all people are created equal and given rights and liberties by God the King. Do you realize that the reason the church is persecuted in third world countries and under tyrannical dictators is because they know that the very existence of the church is a threat to all forms of unjust government. The church is the only organization that has a solid grasp of the truth and the spiritual power to stand up for what's right. We are a force for good in the world. And I have some more good news. My friend Dave Nesberg works as a campus pastor at Grand Valley State University, where our own Gabe Vasek is going to school. And he says this, this generation of university students is often labeled as, well, ways that are not flattering, lazy, selfish, entitled. Yet, he says, my experience with this group has shown me very much the opposite. I think this generation gets it. For campus ministry students, a core non-negotiable part of their spiritual lives includes serving others generously. As I sat with our student leaders and planned for the coming school year, they lamented how the past pandemic year made active service much harder for them. They were determined to make serving others generously generously, yes, a focal point of the coming year. This includes reaching out to fellow students, local churches and neighborhoods and spring break mission trips. They have made this work a key part of their service to God, often to their own financial detriment. They are cheerful givers who get even more cheerful as they serve. That's the energy that we want to unleash in Lake City. But we have to set the example and find the practical ways to love our world that they would want to be involved in doing with us. We just need to follow Jesus' instructions and manage the mission by trusting in God's provision, set the mood for mission by accepting rejection without taking it personally so that we can move on unhindered and staying focused on the main part of the message that all the other good things we might do flows out of who God is as king and what he has made us into as his people. And we're just getting started with that view of the mission. Let me ask a blessing for us. Lord, we pray that these things will be real in our lives, that we are and will continue to be excited about finding ways to serve you and bless our community, ways that the young people around us would love to be involved in so they also get to hear the gospel and find out that the church is way better than they might think it is. We pray, Lord, for your blessings on our ministry in Jesus' name.